so I've actually got an eye beacon attached to my cat. Ruby is alive, Ruby's not going in. Oh, I want to dream for developer happiness. Hi everybody, welcome, thank you. Um, it's great to be in Israel, this is my first time here, I've always wanted to come, so um, yeah, thanks for giving me this opportunity. Okay, so um, this talk is on the value of being lazy, and um, it has a, a second title, which is how I made OpenStruct uh, 10 times faster, Ben alluded to that earlier. and. Um, yeah, I think programmers sort of have a, a reputation of being lazy or they sort of value laziness, like laziness is considered this good thing. Um, because basically, if you think about what it means to be a programmer, uh, if you're not lazy, it means you'll basically do a lot of menial work. You'll, you'll do things, uh, repetitive tasks over and over again. But if you're lazy, you'll just write a program that does those tasks for you. And so the programmer who's not lazy, who will just do those tasks themselves, will uh, not, not be as good of a programmer because they'll just do those tasks instead of writing a program to do it. So I think there's sort of this idea that a lazy programmer is a good programmer, um, and this is basically just a case study of uh, how it worked for me. Okay, so I'm going to make some assertions about Ruby. So uh, these should be uncontroversial, and in fact, I'm going to define them, uh, prove them basically, uh, say what I mean by them. So in Ruby, everything is an object, by which I mean everything. For each thing, uh, you can call anything in the language. You can say thing is object, and that will return true. I think that's an uncontroversial assertion. Um, but my next assertion is that every object has a class, which is to say that for every object, object responds to the method class. Right? This will be true for everything in Ruby. And so taking these two things together, because everything is an object and every object has a class, then we can say everything has a class as well. And um, if you take that one step further, then we can say in Ruby that uh, classes, because classes are things, all classes have a class. Um, so in this case, the object class responds to class and the object's class is class, right? So these are some uncontroversial assertions, uh, hopefully, uh, and they lead to a very nice conclusion. Everything is an object, uh, everything has a class, and therefore classes have a class. Okay, uh, so you can create new objects from class. That's really useful. Um, that's like the main thing that classes do, right? They're like, you define them and then you use them to create objects in Ruby. And so this is an example of creating an object from the object class. Uh, and again, just to sort of prove the point, that object has a class, it's object, the class that created it. Uh, you can do the same thing with something like time. So you can make a new time, that'll be the current time, uh, and that time will have a class. Of course, it's the time class. And um, this is maybe taking it one step further, but from all the assertions we have earlier that, that we all agree are true, we basically proved are true, um, you can create a new class from a class, right? So I can say, define some new class, right? Class.new, and let's store that in something called, called class, a variable, and that variable's class is class, right? So this is not normally the way we, we define classes, um, and of course, I have to spell class with a K uh, because Ruby provides some syntax sugar for defining classes. Uh, the normal way a class is defined looks something like this, um, and in this particular case, it's a very simple class. Uh, this is a point, so it's kind of like a value object. It has uh, two attributes, x and y, uh, which you can sort of think of as coordinates uh, in a grid or something like that, in a plane, a geometric plane. And um, classes like this are very nice. Uh, we're using adder accessor, which is sort of a shorthand for defining two methods. Uh, for each symbol that you pass it, so it's actually defining four methods on that line, a reader and a writer for X and Y. But this whole thing, all six lines of this can actually be collapsed into a single line, like this, using a struct. 
Uh, and these two things are completely equivalent. They do exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. And um, if you think about what a struct does, is it just, it's an object that returns a class, right? When you make a new struct, it gives you back a class. And the same way that class.new gives you back a new class, struct.new gives you back a new class. In this case, the point class. Okay, so uh, structs are a good thing. Hopefully uh, you're convinced that structs are useful. They save you from writing uh, these six lines of code. They can be collapsed into this one line of code. Pretty nice. Um, okay, well, what about this thing called OpenStruct? Well, OpenStruct requires you to define even less upfront. So uh, in this case, we want to do the same thing. We want to define a point. We don't even need a class, right? We can just say, I want a point, so let's just make it an open struct. And then we can just start defining attributes on it willy-nilly, right? It's just it's completely open. Anything you say, you don't have to tell it there's an x method or an x equals method. That will just automatically be defined as soon as you use it, right, at runtime. So this is the cool thing about having a d dynamic language like Ruby. And um, yeah, this is, this is very, very useful. And if it seems familiar, if it reminds you of something, it's because it behaves a lot like hash, right? When you make a new hash, you don't have to say what the keys in the hash are going to be or what the values are going to be. You can just sort of define them as you go, access them as you go. You don't need to define methods on the hash or things like this. So they look very similar. It's just a question of uh, using the dot notation, the, you know, calling a method instead of using the, the angle brackets. So, um, like, why is... Why is this with the dots? Why is OpenStruct better than just using a hash? Why, why would you ever want to use OpenStruct instead of a hash? And there's a bunch of good reasons for that. So I'll give some examples. Um, so uh, yeah, oh, uh, and there's one more point I want to make before I give examples, which is that um, you can actually define an OpenStruct. So in addition to sort of just having a completely freeform OpenStruct and then defining the attributes later as you go, um, you can actually define an OpenStruct upfront with a hash. So if you pass a hash into OpenStruct.new, those attributes will be defined for you automatically. Okay, so why would you want to use this OpenStruct thing? Why is it useful? How is it useful? Well, uh, one common use of it is parsing an API response into an object, right? So it's quite common that you get back some JSON from an API. Uh, JSON, of course, is just a string, and so you want to parse that string, uh, and then that uh, if it's a JSON object, it will parse into a hash, uh, just like I showed before. You can take that hash, put it into the, the open struct, and it will define attributes for every single key in the hash. So, uh, for example, if the API response has a name in it, then you can get that name out of it using nice dot notation as a method, right? So it's just a little bit nicer way to work with uh, API responses. You can call the attributes with methods uh, instead of with square brackets. You can treat them like objects instead of treating them like a hash, which I think is a bit more natural. Uh, it's less typing to use the dot instead of the square brackets, but maybe that's not so compelling, right? Maybe you think, ah, I could just use the hash for this. I don't really need an object. Okay, here's another example. Uh, I think OpenStruct is great for test doubles. So, uh, for example, in this case, we have a validator, right? So uh, the open struct is going to serve as our validator, and we have a postal code. And our postal code class takes a postal code and some validator. And we're making an assertion about how our validator works, right? We're going to say that the validator, uh, after we call the valid method, will receive the validate message. Or, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it will receive the validate message. So um, I think this is quite useful for testing, and you can use open structs as test doubles. And again, because you're asserting that, that they're receiving a message, they're receiving a method call, um, you need that dot syntax, right? You need to be able to call things uh, with a dot, with that dot notation. So open struct is very useful for that. And uh, the last example I'll give of, of how open struct is useful is basically as a configuration object. Uh, so it's quite common that uh, you know, when you're using a gem or something like that, you'll need to do some initial setup. And if you don't want to define exactly what attributes that configuration object can have, if you want it to be able to accept arbitrary attributes, you can make it an open struct. And um, if you do that, then you can basically just yield the options. And then, of course, uh, you can say uh, set options and uh, give it a block, and then just set arbitrary attributes on 
uh, on that block. So I think it's quite nice for configuration. Uh, you can use it as a test double. You can use it for API responses. So OpenStruct, pretty useful. So should you start using it? Uh, well, uh, no. Uh, up until now, the recommendation has basically been not to use OpenStruct. Maybe you use it as a test double uh, in your test environment, but, but the recommendation has been not to use OpenStruct in production because uh, some cynical person on the internet <laughs> says that OpenStruct is slow. And uh, it's true. It's really useful, right? Like, it's really useful. We like OpenStruct. It's handy. But it's a shame that it's so slow because it makes it so that you don't want to use it in production. And so um, these are uh, steps to optimize code uh, by Ben Lovell. So step one is complain that the code is slow on Twitter. Uh, step two is question mark. And step three is profit. Um, so Ben tried this. This is, this is an actual tweet from Ben, by the way. I'm not making this up. This was in um, March 2013. And if you search for OpenStruct slow on Twitter, lots of other people over the years have complained that OpenStruct is slow. Um, and what did they do about it? Well, they tweeted. Um, but uh, when I ran into this, I, um, I decided to take a slightly different approach. So the approach that I took was I benchmarked it to actually see how slow it was compared to other things. Uh, I read the code. So I actually opened the Ruby source code uh, and took a look inside uh, to try to figure out why it was slow. Uh, and then I profited. So uh, I'm going to talk about these steps one at a time, first benchmarking and how I did that. So uh, I use a library called Benchmark IPS. IPS stands for iterations per second. So this is a library by Evan Phoenix uh, that extends the built-in benchmark library that comes with Ruby. So this is a gem. You have to install it, but it's really nice. The reason it's really nice is because it gives you the results in iterations per second. So you don't have to, it will basically run your benchmark for five seconds and then tell you how many times it was able to do whatever you told it to do in five seconds. Uh, so it's very nice um, versus like a normal benchmark where, okay, you try running something once uh, and it takes uh, an immeasurably small amount of time, so then you try running it 100,000 times, and then you're waiting for the benchmark to finish. This always runs for five seconds, and it gives you the results in iterations per second. Uh, so it's quite nice uh, benchmark library, and you use it like this. So you basically just define the two or more functions that you want to benchmark. In this case, I have a struct function that uses the struct. I define it once at the top, uh, and then I define an open struct that does essentially the same thing. These are the results. So uh, struct is basically 35 times, almost 35 times slower. OpenStruct is 35 times slower than just using a struct. Uh, and that's bad. That's really slow. That's a lot slower. Uh, probably unacceptably slow uh, for most applications. And so, uh, again, let's, um, you know, the, if I was a cynical person, maybe I would just tweet about it and leave it at that. Um, but instead of, of just tweeting about it, I decided to read the code. And uh, you might think, because it's, it's Ruby code, because it's part of the actual Ruby language, uh, and the Ruby language is not written in Ruby, it's written in C, that I would have to start reading C code. Um, and, and maybe that's what was scaring people off from actually opening it up. But it turns out that the Ruby standard library, most of the Ruby standard library, is actually written in Ruby, not in C. Um, and so it's actually not so scary to read. Uh, a lot of the code is really nice. It was written... Uh, in large part by Matz uh, and some of the other authors of, of Ruby. So it's very uh, idiomatic Ruby code, I guess almost by definition. It was, it was, a lot of it was written by the author of Ruby. And so it uses Ruby in the way that Ruby was sort of intended to be used. You can learn a lot by reading Ruby's standard library code. And it's Ruby. It's not C. So it's not so scary. Um, so let's take a look at the code. So, um, this was what initialize, uh, the initialize method in OpenStruct looked like. Um, and it was slow. Why is, why is this slow? Okay, well, let's just go line by line. So initialize, okay, it takes a hash. The hash can be nil. That's fine. Uh, first line sets uh, an instance variable called table to an empty hash. That is not slow, right? Uh, setting, setting an instance variable to an empty hash, that's got to be fast. Okay, no problem. Uh, and then it says, if you pass in a hash, right, if you're initializing it with some, some values, then iterate over those values, right? So, you know, in this case, like the point example, I was passing in two, x and y, so for each pair. 
uh, there's a key and a value. So I said like x is 0 and y is 1 or something like that. Uh, the next line takes the key and converts it to a symbol. Um, again, that's got to be got to be fast, right? That's that's not slow. Uh, then it stores the value in the table with the key. Again, totally reasonable, just storing something in a hash, the value. Uh, that can't be slow. Um, so then I got to this line, new ostruct member k, right? And a, a reminder that k here is the key that you passed in, in the point it would be either x or y. So um, that's got to be the slow line, right? Like, that's got to be the bottleneck. Everything else here is just really standard, straightforward Ruby code. Uh, and even if it was slow, I wouldn't know how to optimize it, right? Like, at table equals empty hash. Like, I don't know how to make that faster, right? But like, this new ostruct member thing, maybe that's slow. So let's see what's, what's going on in there. So uh, this, is, this is the definition of new ostruct member. Uh, so you pass in name, which is, remember, one of those keys. Uh, it converts it to a symbol again in case it wasn't a symbol for whatever reason. Uh, and then it says, if, if this, if the object, if the, the struct doesn't already respond to this key, then we're going to define two methods, right? The attribute accessors, a reader and a writer. And you can see how it defines them. And um, yeah, so this is basically like metaprogramming, right? We're like defining methods dynamically. And uh, it turns out that this is quite slow. And the reason why it's slow, okay, in my point example, I only had two keys. I only had x and y. But you can imagine in something like an API response uh, where you're parsing a big JSON object that you're going to have maybe 50 keys or 100 keys or something like that. And so it's going to go through, and for each key, it's going to define two methods. So if you have 100 keys, this is defining two methods dynamically when the object is created, right? This is called from initialize, right? So when, uh, when, when the object is created, if you, have 100, uh, if you have 100 keys, this is going to define 200 methods on that object dynamically. Uh, so so th that's basically why it's slow. Uh, that's that's kind of the, the long story short. And then um, the other thing I noticed was I looked at method missing, right? So OpenStruct also defines method missing. And uh, this is a slightly simplified version. I, I removed a few lines so that it would fit on the slide, mostly error handling. But this is sort of the core of it. So basically, with method missing, it looks to see, is it, an, uh, is it a writer or is it a reader? OK? Uh, does, it, does the method end in an equal sign, right? Are you saying x equals 1, or are you saying x, right? So if you say x equals 1, that's that first branch, right? If the name. Uh, it uses a regular expression to see if it ends in an equal sign. Uh, and if that's true, it calls this new ostruct member thing uh, and sets that value in the table. So this is basically uh, defining a method. If you call a method, that method isn't found, it defines that method and then gives you the return value. And then in the other case, uh, the else or else if, uh, then it's a reader. Um, and in the case of the reader, it does the same thing, right? So we're always calling this new ostruct member. So basically, my intuition was, if you go back to the beginning, to this initialize thing, we're calling this new ostruct member up front for every single attribute that this object gets initialized with. So again, if you get a, a JSON response with 100 attributes, then uh, it's going to create 200 methods up front. But what if you only want the user's name, right? You're parsing this into an open struct. You're defining 200 methods. Maybe you're only going to call one of those methods, or 10 of those methods, or five of those methods, right? So let's not define those methods here in initialize when the object is first created. Let's just do it when we call the method, right? We can do that in Ruby. We have method missing, and we're already doing it. So my patch to make open struct 10 times faster was this. Um, there, were, there were a few other changes I needed to make around um, respond to, so that uh, respond to, if you said something responds to a method, it would be true, uh, because you're not defining those methods. Um, but again, even that's lazy. So uh, I just, can you see that pink? Is there enough contrast? I just removed that line, and everything worked, all the tests passed, 
uh, and it was 10 times faster. So I'll show you the benchmark. This is what it looked like before, 30, 35 times slower, just as a reminder. Uh, this is what it looked like after, so it's about 10 times faster. Uh, still three times slower than a struct, but in the same order of magnitude and uh, quite comparable performance, I would say. Okay, just by deleting one line of code. Now, that got me thinking, like, um, okay, and this is the pull request that I made to Ruby. Uh, I included the benchmark. Um, it got a lot of thumbs up and eventually got merged. Um, and then, uh, of course, after I did that, so this is like, I searched on Twitter for OpenStruct slow and responded to everybody with like, hey, I fixed that for you, um, and uh, a link to the GitHub pull request. And then um, like Andy, my friend Andy here, responded like, I just looked at your pull request and saw the diff and was like, whoa. So yeah, it just removed one line. Um, so that got me thinking like, um, like, this has been this way for a really long time. How long has it been this way, right? Like there, there's been years that it's been 10 times slower than it needed to be. Anyone could have removed that line. Anyone could have like taken the time to read the code, figure out what was going on, right? Like we just did it in 20 minutes. So uh, like why didn't anyone do that? Or how long has it been since anyone did that? So I did a, a reverse log of uh, the ostruct.rb file that defines OpenStruct uh, and I found out that OpenStruct was written by Maths originally uh, in 1998. Uh, I think it was released in Ruby 1.2. So unless you're using 1.0, uh, basically OpenStruct has always been a part of Ruby uh, for almost uh, anyone who in this room, I, I suspect, who's been using it. Um, and yeah, like, you know, Maths could have done this in 1998. Uh, somebody could have done it in 1999. Somebody could have done it in 2000. Nobody did it until uh, Ruby 2.3, which is coming out uh, December, later this year. Um, that will be the first version of, of Ruby with a lazy OpenStruct. Uh, and uh, a significantly faster OpenStruct, I would say an OpenStruct that you could defensively use in production uh, just by removing one line of code. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so let's talk about this concept, the concept that allowed this optimization to take place, this concept of lazy evaluation, because I think that's a pretty cool concept. So uh, it's a concept that comes from languages like Haskell, um, and what it means is that expressions aren't evaluated when they're bound to variables. Um, but evaluation is deferred until the results are needed by other, other parts of, uh, by other computations, right? So the idea is, instead of defining these methods up front in the case of OpenStruct, uh, let's define those methods only when we need them. Let's be lazy about it. And uh, in Ruby 2, lazy enumerable was added. So Haskell is lazy by default. Ruby is not lazy by default. And uh, if Ruby 2 made uh, Ruby lazy by default in the way that Haskell is, it would have broken all your programs. Um, so instead, Ruby added this cool thing called lazy enumerable. And it works just like regular enumerable, um, but it's lazy, meaning that the results aren't evaluated uh, when, the met when, the, when the variable's bound. It's only evaluated when you ask for results. So I'll show a few examples of what that means. So this is an example of, um, so let's say you want to find the first five perfect squares that are over 1,000, right? So that's kind of a weird thing to want to do, but maybe you want to do that. So what I do is I create a range from one all the way up to infinity. And uh, I say that this range is lazy. It's a lazy enumerable. So uh, I store that in lazy integers. And then I say lazy integers.collect, and then I square the integers. Now, if this wasn't lazy, this program would just get stuck on that line, squaring every integer from one all the way up to infinity, right? But because it's lazy, it's not going to do that. What it's going to do is it's going to pipeline each in integer through each block, through each function, right? So first, it's going to take one, the first integer in the range, uh, and it's going to square it. Now, one times one is one. So uh, it takes that one, the result of that computation, and then passes it on to the next uh, function in the pipeline, onto the next block. And that block selects even, which means, uh, yeah, it's only going to let things through to, uh, to the next one 
if the number is even. Now, 1 times 1, 1 squared, is 1. That's odd. So then we go back to the beginning and take the next, uh, the next integer out of our lazy enumerable. OK, so then we get 2. So 2 squared is 4, right? 2 times 2. Uh, that goes to, uh, goes to the select. Is it even? Yes, it's even. It's selected. But then we reject anything that's less than 1,000, right? So this keeps going, uh, pipelining through one value at a time until we, until we get to 5. And because this last line is really important, because we say first 5, it knows when to stop, right? So instead of first, like the normal way that Ruby works, if you didn't have this lazy, the program would never terminate. It would run forever, just squaring everything. But because we say it's lazy, we're pipelining through one value at a time. Uh, and then we stop when we get to 5, right? You have to give it some termination condition. Uh, otherwise, it'll, it'll go forever, right? If you replace that first 5 with 2a, 2 array, for example, OK, then it's going to go forever. But as long as you have something where you say, OK, I just want the first 5, that'll work. Uh, I'm going to show a few more examples of this, uh, maybe more practical ones. This one's kind of contrived. OK. Um, so let's say you want to find twin primes. Just a, a reminder, twin primes are prime numbers that are just uh, two apart, right? So they're sort of next to each other on the number line, just separated by two. Um, so you can say, uh, you can define a lazy prime. So prime is an enumerator. Uh, just by calling dot lazy on it, you get a lazy enumerator. Uh, and you can select all the primes where x minus 2 is also prime. Uh, then you can sort of map those into pairs uh, and take the first five or first 10 or whatever. This is a very efficient way to calculate lazy primes. Um, there's even a more efficient way to do it, actually. So uh, you can actually define your own enumerator. Uh, I call this one pairs after first. And what this is going to do is it's going to yield the first value. Um, uh, yeah. So if uh, it's going to yield the first value, the first prime number. And then after that, it's going to give you two of each. Right. So the idea is like. Uh, the first prime number, uh, I guess, is 2, and then, or 1, I don't know, it depends how you count it. So it'll give you, let's say it's 2, so it'll give you 2, and then the next prime number is 3. So it'll give you 3, 3, and then the next prime number is 5, so it'll give you 5, 5, 7, 7, 11, 11, and so on. Uh, so this is just an enumerator that's yielding those values 2, 3, 3, 5, 5, 7, 7, 11, 11. Okay. Once you have that, you can do an even more efficient version. So you can basically slice up those pairs uh, into slices of two with each slice, again, just using the, the great enumerable functions that are built into Ruby. So I can say each slice. Um, and what that's going to do is that's going to take those pairs, like 2, 3, 3, 5, 5, 7, 7, and split them into two. So it's going to be 2, 3, 3, 5, 5, 7, uh, 7, 11, so on. Um, and then you can really efficiently say, OK, I have these pairs. Just select the ones where x plus 2 equals y. Right? So 3, 5, for example, x plus 2 equals y. 7, 11, not true. Uh, super efficient way to get twin primes using lazy evaluation. Uh, here's another example. So uh, let's say you want to find the first, uh, the first 10, or the next 10, I should say, Friday the 13th. So we have a date range that's starting at today, going to the year 9,099. It could be anything. I was running out of room on the slide, so I just made it 9,999 um, far in the future. And I'm going to select all the days that are 13, uh, throw away anything that's not 13, throw away anything that's not Friday. Do you get that reference that Freddy Krueger, that you have Friday the 13th in Israel that made it here? Yes? OK, I see some heads nodding. Good. Uh, I'm glad this example makes sense. We have some Friday the 13th friends in the audience. OK, great. Um, so if you want to find out when are the next 10 Friday the 13th, I think that's sort of an interesting question. Uh, and you can answer it this way. It's very efficient, right? If you, again, if this wasn't lazy, first, what you would have to do is you would have to, you would have to basically map an array of every single date between now and the year 9,999. And then you wouldn't even know if that was enough. Like maybe the first 10, maybe there was only 9 up till that point, And the 10th was actually after the year 10,000. So this is a really nice way to, to solve the problem, I think. Um, and here's the last example. So I think this is a really nice one. Um, if you wanted to find a string in a text file without reading that entire file into memory, right? 
So you just want to see, is this string, uh, in this case, um, some regular expression, right? That can be anything. In a text file, I don't want to open that file and, and read every single line into an array, right? That's what read lines normally does. It takes every single line and gives you an array of each line. All I want to do uh, is go through and one at a time see, is it on this line, is it on this line? If it's a 10,000 line file and it's on the third line, this is going to return after it hits the third line. It's going to stop. And so um, hopefully I've convinced you that being lazy can be good, uh, being lazy can be efficient, and being lazy leads to some very elegant code. I think these examples that I've shown uh, are not only efficient, but they're also very beautiful uh, and very sort of Ruby-like in the way that they work. Um, I want to thank a few people in particular. Uh, first, Zachary Scott, who uh, I, I attended this conference called the Ruby Open Source uh, Software Conference and Hackathon in Berlin a few months ago. Uh, Zachary Scott is on the Ruby core team, uh, and he sort of inspired me to work on this problem, um, to look into it. And uh, I couldn't have done it without him. He, he really pushed me to do it. So thanks to Zachary and everyone who organized uh, Rosconf. Also, thanks to Rails is Israel for letting me come here uh, and talking about it, inviting me to your country. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you for coming and watching. Uh, so that's all I've got. I don't know if there's time for questions. I think, yeah, okay. Yeah, if there's questions, happy to answer. Maybe you can run with this mic and I can use that one. Uh, about the, op uh, the open struct code here. <laughs> Who, where are you? First oh, of all. Hi. About the open struct code, yeah. uh, we saw that uh, they have also met method missing and also initializer. So why did they have the method missing? Did they didn't the initializer uh, calling the the method cover its own, cover all the use cases? Uh, good question. So with open struct, you're allowed to define um, you can define attributes up front, but you can also define them arbitrarily afterwards. So I can say uh, open struct dot new x colon zero, and that will give you an open struct with an attribute x, but then later on, I can say that object, whatever it's called, point, uh, y equals one or whatever. So you need both, um, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll just repeat it for people who couldn't hear and for the video. So the question was, why do you need to actually define a method? Uh, in, inside of method missing, couldn't you always just, um, uh, couldn't, couldn't you just uh, basically pull it out of that table hash and just use the hash uh, and, and method missing together to make it look like there's, um, there's always, uh, like there's a method defined? Um, and I'm trying to think of a reason why you actually need to define the methods um, other than respond to. How do you define performance? Uh, somebody's saying performance, which I guess is right, but a hash lookup is pretty fast. So, uh, ah, calling method missing itself is slow. Yeah, that's a good point. So you wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's. Yeah, I think that's right. So, so method missing is quite slow. So once you, um, you calling it once makes sense, but you wouldn't want to invoke method missing every single time. Yeah, that's a good answer. That makes sense. Uh, other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, so in some scenarios, if 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 uh, someone is accessing all the attributes of the of this uh, open structs object, uh, your your improvement actually maybe it's slower because the that's method such a good question, man. Method like missing question. is like, you know, in in the initializer don't have method missing, so um. this is hard to see. Ruby, Ruby. Uh, yeah. So somebody asked that question on the GitHub issue. Um, uh, maybe the internet's going to be slow, eh? Okay, well, uh, I can do a little dance while this loads. Uh, no, you know what I can do while this loads, actually? I can plug um, my other talk. So, 
later on this evening, I'll be doing uh, Ruby trivia uh, for those who are interested. Woo. So yeah, um, for people who are interested in uh, trivial things, um, <laughs> <laughs> things that don't matter but maybe are interesting, uh, yeah, you can come to that and answer, answer some questions. Okay. Uh, let's see if it loaded yet. I can't. Ah. Oh no. <laughs> Terrible. Okay. The first question is totally out there. Um, uh, okay. So the answer, sorry, uh, I completely flubbed this. The answer to your question about uh, what if you access all the attributes is that uh, it's, it's uh, even slightly faster. There's no, there's no performance payment if you access all the attributes. So basically, that's like the worst case scenario. And in the worst case scenario where you have like 100 attributes and you're accessing all of them, like all of the readers and all of the writers, which seems very unlikely that you would be like overwrite, like initializing 100 values and then overwriting them all and then accessing them. But like if you do that, it's, it's identical performance. It's no worse. So uh, the reason I was trying to pull up the GitHub issue is because, um, because I have, uh, because I, I uh, proved that. I had a, somebody else ask the exact same question as you on GitHub and I benchmarked it and showed that it was no worse. So that was a big part of the patch getting merged because it was, uh, even in the worst case scenario, it's uh, not a performance degradation. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks, Eric.